This video has been brought to you by Squarespace, the online platform for building your business or growing your brand. More on them in a few moments. Let's talk about the big console battle of the early 90s, Super Nintendo versus the Sega Mega Drive, aka the Sega Genesis. Yes, these two were pretty much neck and neck in popularity in their heyday, battling it out blow for blow. But let's not forget the underdog 2, NEC's TurboGrafx-16, known as the PC Engine in Japan, a distant third but still a player. I own all three of these, of course I do, but full disclosure, my own personal favourite has to be the Super Nintendo. It has so many great games that I love and well I'm not the only one according to a poll I recently put up. I'm going to try though and keep this about reels not feels, I'm going to try and keep this objective, determine which is the most powerful system and why. The final answer to playground arguments, maybe, I doubt I'm going to disavow anyone of their childhood favourites but we all might learn something in the process. And also this is just going to be about the original consoles themselves, not any add-ons. And also I'm not going to talk about which has the best games, Mario vs Sonic vs Bonk or whatever, no this is just about the hardware. Which has the best features for gaming? Where do we start? Well, Street Fighter 2 I think, a game that appears on all three systems. Why here? Well, I think it illustrates a very important point that these machines really are comparable. They were marketed head to head certainly at the same time, competing for the same gaming cash, but also they were pretty broadly similar in their capabilities and their architecture. Street Fighter 2 was an absolutely enormous game in the early 90s and the fact that all three of these systems are able to run it pretty well was a big deal. So many game systems of the time just couldn't hack Street Fighter 2 or anything like it and it was one of the factors that made a lot of older 8-bit machines start to seem past their sell-by date. None of these versions are perfect translations of the arcade original but they do all make a pretty decent fist of it. If you were a Street Fighter fan back then you'd probably be pretty happy with any of these versions as long as you had the 6 button controller. I've left off labelling them up till now, maybe if you really know the systems you could guess, but it's not so easy and that sort of proves my point. These systems were devoted to colourful 2D graphics as was the style at the time and they all do it in pretty much the same way fundamentally, they use tile based graphics. Yes, tiles, T-I-L-E, every time I say that word someone pops up in the comments. Tails, trowels, towels, tawny owls, what are you on about man? I mean graphics that are built up of predefined blocks of pixels like these. Character based graphics you might call them, arranged on the screen to create backgrounds and sprites or moving objects. All three of these systems devote themselves to dealing with these tiles to draw their graphics and that's going to be the basis of a lot of these comparisons. So let's start with colours. Each tile is a block 8 pixels high by 8 pixels wide. How many colours can each one have? Well on all three systems the answer is basically the same a lot of the time, 15 or 16. That's how many individual colours you can have in each little block. Sometimes tiles will have one less colour available because they need to have invisible parts so you can see what's below them, but they all basically have 4 bits per pixel. Usually that's the case, but the Super NES can go further than this and have up to 8 bits per pixel, though games don't use this mode as often. Most of the time we could call this even across all three systems, for many games that's true, but the Super NES has the ability to go above and beyond this when it wants to, up to 256 colours per tile. Yes, there's only 64 pixels in an 8x8 tile, but it can pick from 256 colours. Now, total number of colours, this is an easy comparison that the Super NES again wins with 15 bit colour giving a palette of about 32,000 shades to choose from. Both the Mega Drive and the Turbo Graphics have 9 bit colour or 512 total possible colours available for them to choose from, putting them both quite a bit behind the Super NES in this one. Now let's move on to the total number of colours on screen available at once. Starting with the Mega Drive we get 61 colours in total for everything on the screen, backgrounds and sprites. 
Each tile can choose its colours from one of four sub palettes, so a set of colours of 15 with one background colour that's the same in every one. Games still can definitely look pretty darn fantastic, but this is less than the other systems that we'll see in well, Comic Zone here, showing just what is possible even with this limitation. On to the Super Nintendo, and that can have up to 256 colours on screen. The exact details of this vary depending on which of the Super NES's many graphics modes you're using, but 256 is basically the max, and the wonderful worlds of Donkey Kong Country here showing what this means in practice. Though, in this game and many others, there is a bit more going on. But moving on to the TG-16, well, that is the winner at this point, with a total of 482 colours on screen at one time, potentially. Backgrounds get 16 sub palettes of 15 colours to choose from, giving them 240 colours in total, and sprites get another 16 sub palettes of 15, giving them another 240, plus one extra background colour and one border colour. This definitely makes it sound like the Turbo Graphics is the winner here, and well, by this measure it is, but well, there has to be a but. Yes, both the Super Nintendo and the Genesis can do some extra tricks to make their graphics even more colourful. Nothing that the Genesis can really do will get it up to the level of the Turbo Graphics outside of maybe some tech demos, making it the definite loser, but the Super NES, well, that might be able to go a bit further thanks to some tricks with transparency, but we will come back to that. And just briefly before I move on, maybe you could hit that like button if you're in any way inclined to, it does help me out, and hey, maybe subscribe too if you haven't already. Now let's move on to backgrounds, which should be pretty self-explanatory what I'm talking about. Yeah, all three of these systems have dedicated features to drawing backgrounds constructed out of tiles. Let's start with the simplest case, the Turbo Graphics or PC Engine, if you're tired of me calling it that. Yeah, all these systems have at least two names that they are known by around the world, and whatever I call them, someone complains in the comments, so I'm just going to switch back and forth between all the different names just to annoy as many people as possible. But anyway, the PC Engine or Turbo Graphics or whatever has a single background layer that is larger than what is visible on the screen. You can scroll it around in four directions, making different parts visible, and by loading new graphics in off camera as you scroll, you can create very large levels for your character to move around in. You can also split the screen into strips and scroll them at different rates, giving rise to all sorts of lovely effects like Cory Yoon here with the different bands of background moving along at different rates, giving the impression of depth. You can also freeze a part of the screen in place and use it as a status bar like Darius does. Moving on to the Mega Drive or Genesis, well that goes one step further by adding a second background layer. This is a whole new set of graphics that lay on top of the first. Both of these layers are a bit smaller than on the PC Engine, but the key thing is that they can be both on the screen at the same time, with one layer visible under the other. That's what's going on here in the opening level of Sonic 2. The foreground is one layer with the platforms and ramps, and the fields and the sky and other stuff is another layer, which both move independently of each other. As well as this, these layers can also be split like they are on the PC Engine, an effect that is applied to the yellow spotted meadow that can be seen in the distant background. You can also, on the Mega Drive, split the background up into vertical strips as well, making this effect in the amazing panorama cotton possible. A similar idea, but the other way up. And just to reiterate, both layers here share the same 61 colour palette, the same that the sprites use. The extra layer doesn't affect the total amount of colours on screen. There is, though, one trick that can increase this amount, as I alluded to before. It is possible to change the colour palettes that are being used in the middle of a frame, essentially swap out the colours that you've got for a new lot halfway down at the screen. You can see this in action on the original Sonic, where a much greener set of colours is added where the waterline is. With this trick, you can potentially double the number of colours on screen, but it is an either-or thing. When you change the colour palette, it affects all the layers and the sprites and everything. You could probably swap out the colours more than once to even triple the amount of colours available, but do any games do that? I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you know of any that do. 
Moving on to the Super Nintendo, things get way more complex. Here we have 8 different background modes numbered from 0 to 7. I don't need to go into all of them in detail, but there is a lot of options. Suffice to say that basically anything the Mega Drive can do with backgrounds, the Super NES can do too, but with great big honking bells and whistles. You can have up to four different background layers in mode zero, though using that many limits you to just four colours per tile and 32 overall for each layer. More commonly used was mode one, which gave two layers of 128 colours each and one more with 32 colours. And yes, you can do column scrolling stuff like you can with the Mega Drive, and that's what's responsible for the famous touch fuzzy get dizzy freakout stage from Yoshi's Island, though using that effect does limit you to just two 128 colour backgrounds. There's a pretty baffling range of different things you can do here, and that's not forgetting the famous mode 7. This uses a single 256 colour background layer, though that is 8 bits per pixel, and it can be rotated, stretched, squashed and scaled with what's known as affine transformations. Mario Kart is of course the classic example of Mode 7. Background maps like this one put through the Mode 7 ringer come out as these rotating courses that stretch off to the horizon. You can mix and match different graphics modes too in horizontal bands on the screen. Like Street Racer here with a Mode 1 background at the top allowing for a parallax effect on the distant scenery and a Mode 7 rotating track at the bottom. Developers came up with loads of clever tricks swapping out background modes, making use of Mode 7 and the other modes to create all sorts of effects. The Super NES can also do some very neat transparency tricks with backgrounds too, and the, well, the details are complex as always, but it allows for stuff like this water effect in Macross Scrambled Valkyrie. Basically, layers don't have to be solid, they can be translucent, and you can see the layers below them with four slightly different methods for determining how the colours change. This, in practice, increases the amount of colours visible on the screen by quite a lot. New shades created by blending the layers, and they don't take away from the total 256 colours defined by the graphics. So which is the best of these three after looking at the options? Do I really need to spell it out? Yes, the Super NES, no question, of course. Anything the other two can do, the Super Nintendo can do too, but more so. Is there any way they can claw anything back? Well, maybe, but this could be the killing blow. Even without Mode 7, the Super Nintendo is just so much more capable in this important area. Next, I think we've got to consider sprites, the stuff that moves on the screen. That's up next, but first, here's a word from today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is a platform that lets you make your own website for whatever you want, whatever you need, whether it's personal, professional, business or just a hobby. If you want, if you need some sort of a web presence, well, Squarespace can do all that for you. It's not just a blogging platform, though you absolutely can use it to set up a blog if you want, and it's not just more social media, though it does integrate very well with all that kind of stuff. You can use it to sell your products, advertise your services, promote your brand, or, like me, use it to support your YouTube channel. And this is not like it was in the bad old days of terrible web design. Extremely professional results are possible without specialist skills or knowledge very easily, thanks to a whole load of customizable templates and other tools. So head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com forward slash Sharopolis for 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And when they say free trial, they really do mean free trial. It's not one of those things where you have to enter your credit card details and then remember to cancel it. It's just free. You pay at the end if you want to carry on. There's nothing hidden and no tricky marketing. So, thank you so much to Squarespace, back to the console battle, and let's talk about sprites. Sprites are, as I say, moving objects. Players, enemies, bullets, all that kind of stuff. They're all made of tiles, and all three systems have limitations regarding how many they can draw and how big they can be. Let's start with the PC Engine again, because that's the simplest case once more. 
Sprites can be from 16 by 16 pixels to 32 by 64 pixels in size, and you can have up to 16 on a single line, though 32 pixel wide sprites count as two. The maximum number you can have on the screen at any one time is 64, and like the backgrounds, they can have up to 15 colours defined with 8 palettes to choose from, so the total sprite layer can be up to 240 colours. The Mega Drive does a little better in terms of pure numbers, but not in terms of colours. A maximum of 80 sprites on the screen at once in sizes from 8x8 pixels to 32x32. You can have a maximum of 20 sprites per line, and yes, like on the PC Engine, larger sprites can end up counting as more when they're taken together. Sprites on the Mega Drive make use of the same colour palettes as the background, like I've said before, so you end up with the same 61 colours as everything else on the screen. That does mean if you do the palette swap trick, the sprite colours change as well. Now the Super NES, well, that can handle 128 sprites, with sizes from 8x8 to 64x64 pixels. You can have a maximum of 32 sprites with a maximum of 34 sprite tiles on a single line. And when I say line here, I mean a scan line or a horizontal row of pixels. That's what graphics like these are ultimately constructed out of when they are sent to the TV. Super Nintendo sprites have 8 palettes of 15 colours to choose from, giving them a maximum of 120 colours with one transparent background colour. Depending on the background mode being used, this can either be a whole new set of palettes for the lower colour backgrounds, or it's shared with the background in the 256 colour modes. Once again, this really does sound like the Super Nintendo might be the winner, doesn't it? I mean, it does seem to have better capabilities, but well, the devil is in the details, I'm afraid. When you start drilling down into the fine details, it turns out the Super Nintendo doesn't handle sprites in terms of numbers that much better than the other two, certainly the Mega Drive, and it can be worse in some situations. The Super NES is limited to just two sizes of sprites at any given time from a list of six size combinations. So, even though you may have more sprites to play with, you can end up wasting them if they're too large for what you are doing. If you've got a 64 by 64 pixel sprite in the memory, it still counts as 64 by 64 pixels, even if many of those pixels aren't filled in, and it eats into the number of sprites you can have on that line and on the screen. Plus, the way the Super NES handles sprite programming is a bit more inefficient, so it can get bogged down more easily trying to draw them all. And yes, Gradius 3 that we've been looking at is particularly notorious for its lagging sprites. This puts the real-world performance of the Super NES much closer to the Mega Drive in terms of numbers, and still the PC Engine makes a pretty good showing, especially when you consider how colourful sprites can potentially be on this system. But transparency effects also come into play here too, though. Yes, this is not just limited to backgrounds. Big Boo in Super Mario World being a memorable example. The PC Engine can't do this, and neither can the Mega Drive, and not in anything like the same way. So, with that in mind, I would probably put the Super NES ahead in terms of sprites too, but not by much. All three systems do do a pretty good sprite game, way better than any of the 8-bit systems, all of which would choke on huge characters like these. Yes, we're back to fighting games again here. So at this point, I can't help but feel that the Super Nintendo is cruising to victory, but there is some more to talk about, isn't there? What about sound? Now this, this is not going to be easy. There's a real lot of subjectivity in this. What you personally like could well play a big part in which one of these wins, more so than with other features. Personal preference here is going to be huge, so let's lay out what we've got. So first off we have the PC Engine with a 6 channel programmable sound generator built right into its CPU, like what the NES did with its sound but much more sophisticated. Actually quite a common theme on the PC Engine which was built to be the NES but better. Anyway, these 6 channels can all be programmed individually with 5 bit 32 sample waveforms allowing for a lot of options in creating sound. This is in contrast to a lot of earlier sound chips like what you'd find in the NES or C64 where you'd find a fixed set of waveforms to choose from. 
Plus, on the PC Engine, some channels have extra functions. Channel 2 can act as a low-frequency oscillator on Channel 1, allowing for vibrato effects, and Channels 5 and 6 can also generate noise, handy for things like drums. As well as this, you can also coax the chip into outputting pulse code modulated samples, bypassing the synthesis functions altogether. The downside of this being that it will sap quite a lot of CPU power, though it is capable of putting out pretty good quality sound. This whole setup is quite similar to a lot of arcade games from the 80s and is well in advance of anything you'd see on many home systems available at the time when this first came out. It even had some stereo panning effects. How does this compare to the other two systems? Well, moving on to the Genesis, that has two sound chips controlled by their own dedicated CPU, a Z80. Yes, it's got the original Master System's four-channel sound chip, plus another one specially for the Genesis, a Yamaha six-channel chip based around FM synthesis. What does that mean? Well, this is a more sophisticated method of generating sound that was very common in the 80s. In fact, this chip was really a sort of stripped-down version of Yamaha's DX7 professional synthesizer, which was just everywhere at the time. Without getting too bogged down in the details, FM synthesis, or frequency modulation, was quite a big step up from the sort of thing the PC Engine could do. I'll put some links below to sources if you want to find out more about it. On top of that, the Mega Drive could also play PCM samples as well, and in better quality than the Turbo graphics. Even on the Mega Drive with the extra CPU, this was still fairly resource-hungry, so games tended not to use this type of sound very often, usually just for spot effects. The key thing is, though, that we have more channels available here that can do more stuff, and with its own dedicated CPU, which takes away fewer resources from the main processor. There is, though, still a lot of room for subjective choice, and if you told me you just preferred the sound of the Turbo Graphics just because, well, I wouldn't think you're mad, because they do both have their own unique, distinctive sound. And finally, what about the Super NES? That really has to be the one to beat if we've learnt anything from this comparison so far. And yeah, it is really a different beast entirely. Its sound is based solely around digital samples. And yeah, let's just have a quick listen to the intro music to Secret of Mana. I'm sorry, I may be showing some bias here, but I absolutely love this intro. Anyway, the SNES, a different beast. It had its own separate processor like the Mega Drive, but this powered a digital signal processor with eight separate channels. Everything on the Super NES was done with samples, whether of real instruments or just synthesized sounds, it doesn't matter. It could be either, giving a tremendous range of possibilities. Now, the exact inner workings of the Super Nintendo's sound subsystem are a bit of a mystery, even to Nintendo at times, it seems, but we can say that it did have some problems. One of them was lack of available memory. It did have its own pool of RAM separate from everything else, which is great, but this was just 64K, not a whole lot when you're dealing with digital audio. Especially when you consider that this needs to include the code that the Specialist Sound CPU runs to. The result is lower sample quality, that sort of hollow muffle sound that some Super NES music can have is because of this. Although it used advanced for the time audio compression, it still meant that you lost a lot of the higher frequencies, some of the definition of the sound. Despite this, though, the system's sound is really just a more primitive version of the sort of sound hardware you find in many modern systems, meaning that it's very flexible. There's not much that the Mega Drive or PC Engine can do that the Super NES can't emulate, but hardware limitations do hold back the final result somewhat. Personally, I think the Super NES wins this one based purely on technology. It can just do so much, but I can totally understand if you disagree. The Mega Drive or Genesis especially has some really great tunes with a unique sound in its catalogue, so yeah, I can see why you might pick that ahead of the Super NES. 
But that said, the soundtrack to the modern Super Mario World hack, Casio Mario World, is just something else entirely, and you would never hear anything like that on the Mega Drive, so, well, the choice is yours. Okay then, now we've seen the graphics, we've heard the sound, let's get on to processing power. Once again, I'll lay it out for you. The Turbo Graphics has at its heart the Hudson Soft HUC6280 chip. Yes, of course, that old dear that we're all intimately familiar with. <laughs> okay, what 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 is that? Well, it's basically a jazzed up version of the 6502 CPU that was in the NES. It retains full compatibility with the original more or less and has two speed modes, 1.79 MHz, the same as the NES, and a massive 7.16 MHz mode, making this one very speedy 8-bit CPU. And yes, it is definitely an 8-bit CPU, potentially making this system, strictly speaking, an 8-bit one if you want to look at it like that. What does the Super NES have? Well, it's another souped-up 6502, the Rico 5A22, a derivative of the Western Digital 65C816. Yeah, I get the impression that these chips were named by the engineers themselves without any involvement from the marketing department. Anyway, this is, again, pretty something that retains pretty much full compatibility with the original NES processor, but now it has a 16-bit mode and runs at between 1.79 again and 3.58 MHz maximum. By some definitions, this is still not actually a true 16-bit processor. It has an 8-bit data bus, which basically means that it has to access data from the memory in 8-bit or single-byte chunks. Have we been lied to all these years? Is the Super Nintendo really just an 8-bit system? Well, I don't know. It just depends on how you define the whole thing. And it was only ever a stupid marketing term anyway, 8-bit and 16-bit. But it does have a 16-bit arithmetic logic unit, which by other definitions does make it actually 16-bit. The Sega Mega Drive <laughs> Genesis, I just know the comment section is going to be full of people. When I was growing up, we called it the Sega Mega Dega, and you'd be a fool and a communist to call it anything else. Clearly, you know nothing about video games. I'm sorry, I'm just, I just, I don't know what else to say. It's the Mega Drive, it's the Genesis, and powering it was one thing that we can probably agree on the name of, the Motorola 68000, running at 7.6 Mega. Hertz. This one is definitely at least a 16-bit chip at the very least. It's got a 16-bit data bus, but it can handle 32-bit data internally, making it by some people's reckonings a 16-32-bit hybrid. So which of these is the most powerful? Which is the winner? Well, I don't know. I really don't. It might sound like the 68000 would have to be the victor. It's got the highest clock speed, and it is, at the very least, 16 bits. That's got to be the best, right? Well, it is very difficult to compare processors of different families like this. 6502-based chips in particular are known to be very efficient in terms of clock cycles, meaning the slower clock speed might not necessarily mean the processor is slower. Anecdotal stuff that I've read online puts the Super Nintendo's CPU pretty close to the 68000 when it comes to real-world number crunching, the type of stuff you'd actually want to do in games. And, well, what about the CPU in the PC Engine? Well, a 6502 at over 7 MHz is pretty speedy. I would not be at all surprised to hear that there are scenarios where that is actually easily the fastest of the three, but I can't say for sure. Even with a whole industry devoted to benchmarking today, it's still pretty difficult to compare modern processors, even when they're of the same family. Comparing old CPUs with very different architectures and very different characteristics and no standardised benchmarking tools is not going to be easy. The best that I've really been able to find is just people speculating on web forums, and well, you've just got to take all that with a grain of salt. If I had to pick, though, well, I'd still give this to the Mega Drive. Why? Well, the 68000 was a really very widely used chip in the 80s and well into the 90s. 
Apple Macs used them, the Amiga, the ST, tons of arcade machines. It was a really powerful CPU that a lot of people knew how to program, a lot of coders knew how to get the best out of it. It was an industry standard and the other two were much more obscure, even if they are based on fairly well-known architecture. Finding people to write good code for either of those two would be quite a bit more difficult. And real-world examples bear this out. When it comes to CPU-heavy workloads, the Mega Drive does, I think, do the best pretty clearly. With it able to crank out a lot of very impressive 3D stuff on the stock hardware, like Duke Nukem here. But about that stock hardware, how can we forget all those enhancement chips that the Super NES has in its arsenal? Do we count the use of those extra chips in the cartridges to increase the capabilities of the system? Well, the turbo graphics didn't really make use of that sort of technology at all, but the Mega Drive it did, well, once in the form of the Virtua Processor which appeared in Virtua Racing. The opposite number on the Super NES was the Super FX chip, found in Star Fox amongst other games. Which one is the most powerful? Well, we're back to difficulties in benchmarking and comparing different chips, but from what I can gather, the Virtual Processor was possibly a bit faster than the Super FX. Certainly the original Super FX chip and probably the Super FX 2 chip as well, the one that was found in Doom and Yoshi's Island. But there were way more Super NES enhancement chips that ended up doing all kinds of things in a whole range of games. But, well, they weren't quite as common as they are sometimes made out to be. Out of over 1,700 releases for the Super Nintendo, only 66 games used some sort of enhancement chip. Now, admittedly, this did include some of the system's best-known games. Mario Kart had a DSP chip, but so many didn't. Donkey Kong Country, Chrono Trigger, they didn't use anything special. If we are going to count enhancement chips, well, the Super NES wins out on that front just because it used them more often for so many other things. But even without that, the Super NES is pretty strong. What else do we need to consider in this comparison? Well, how about blast processing? We need to think about that. Surely the awesome Genesis power that the Super Nintendo lacked. Well, if blast processing was anything other than just a stupid marketing buzzword, it was direct memory access. This means the ability to move data around from the cartridge to the video chip's memory to the sound chip to the main RAM without direct intervention from the CPU. This is good because it makes it faster to copy data around, which is always useful. And when it comes to DMA, the Genesis is clearly the fastest of the three in terms of pure throughput. It can definitely move that data around faster than either of the other two. This is another part of the reason the Genesis can do 3D stuff better than the Super NES on the base hardware. The PC Engine is out of the running in this question, its DMA is much more limited, but the Super NES's DMA is still no slouch either, and it is more sophisticated in the way that it's set up. The Super NES has what's called horizontal direct memory access. It can be set up to move data automatically in that very brief window of time in between horizontal lines of pixels being drawn. The Genesis can do this kind of thing, but it's much harder to make it work. And actually, this feature plays a big part in the rotating landscapes of Mode 7. Which one of the two is better? Well, again... I don't really know. Very easily in this comparison we can get into weird hypothetical stuff, what potentially each system could do in the right circumstances, you know, if you set it up right, the pure numbers may be, but I'm trying to keep this more grounded in reality and things that I can show you and demonstrate. But I can tell you that all those playground legends about how the Super NES can't do a game as fast as Sonic because it doesn't have blast processing. Well, there's just there's just no real basis in that kind of stuff. Is there anything else I could talk about? Well, resolution may be the number of pixels on the screen. Each console had a bunch of different resolutions they could use and different games could end up with different pixel densities as a result of this. I'm going to put the Genesis as the winner for this one, as the majority of games tended to use the 320 by 224 pixel mode, which is higher than the majority of Super NES and Turbo Graphics games. 
So yes, Genesis games tended to be a bit less chunky, and it also had a more pleasing aspect ratio, although that may be a controversial view. People do get very worked up about aspect ratios, but, well, there's other stuff that I could maybe mention too. There's the shadow mode that the Genesis had, which allowed colours to be altered, potentially increasing the amount of colours available on the screen, but to good use here in Ranger X, but it's still kind of limited. But Ranger X does make a brilliant point. Sega Genesis, Sega Mega Drive games could look absolutely amazing. That's not in any doubt. Games developed for this system, done by people who know what they are doing, can easily be some of the best this generation has to offer, but it is hard to escape the fact that in pretty much every way, the Super Nintendo has the Genesis beat in terms of technical ability. It really does, I'm sorry, but it's true, I just can't come up with any other conclusion. I mean, certainly there are some types of games that the Genesis can do better without relying on enhancement chips. This is hard driving on the Genesis, not amazingly smooth, but it is pretty good for systems of the era. And this is race driving on the Super NES. Okay, a slightly different game, but close enough. And yes, it's absolutely terrible. On the other hand, though, this is the same game hacked to run using the SA1 chip. This was an official enhancement chip used in quite a few Super NES games, essentially a CPU upgrade to the system built into the cartridge. This unofficial patch by Victor Viella optimising the game to make use of it. If we're going to allow enhancement chips into this comparison, the advantages of the Mega Drive disappear largely. I tried, I really tried to find ways that the Mega Drive or Genesis can beat the Super NES, but, well, it was hard. The best that I can really come up with, though, is just, like I say, hypothetical numbers. If anyone had made more games using the Virtua Processor enhancement chip, then, well, maybe we'd have more to talk about. There are times when the Mega Drive can sometimes have more unique tiles on the screen, and its faster DMA throughput means that it might have been able to have better frame rates in chip-enhanced 3D games, but there's not much to base that on other than speculation. Though Virtua Racing does seem to run better than comparable Super NES Super FX games, I mean, it's certainly, certainly a bit smoother than Stunt Race FX. And then there's the PC Engine or the Turbo Graphics. It entered the competition an underdog and it leaves that way too. It could definitely do some very nice graphics, but its single background layer really holds it back. It can emulate some multi-layer effects with clever coding, but it's not really the same. I'm afraid it suffers here far more with the no add-on restriction than the other two. NEC and Hudson Soft, the console's co-creator, didn't really go in for enhancement chips. They probably wouldn't have fit on the tiny cue card cartridges anyway. Instead, they put all their efforts into the PC Engine CD, and unlike the Sega CD, this was a huge success, in Japan at least. More games came out on CD than on cartridge, in fact, and the slightly bumped specs it offered and the masses of extra storage space it had really made games shine on this system. It was the first console ever to use CD-ROMs, and one of the very first ever publicly available uses of CD-ROM technology full stop. It was a real pioneer. And if we're talking about add-ons, well, Sega did really put in a good effort there, even if it didn't work out so well in the marketplace. Taking account of the Sega CD and the 32X, well, the Genesis can probably outpace the Super NES quite easily, certainly with the 32X's massive processing power and massively enhanced colours. So yeah, I think the Super NES has got to be the winner if we're just talking about the bare system itself and the games that you plug into it. It's got lots of colour, and games use it very well. Its sprite capabilities might not put it that far ahead, but, well, it's got those transparency effects, HDMA stuff, and a whole mixed bag of tricks that its hardware has tucked away that put it at the forefront. Maybe we shouldn't be that surprised. It came out over a year after the Genesis in Japan, at least, and three years after the PC Engine. That's a long time in the computer and electronics business. Things move quickly. 
Looking back at some of this footage now, I really can't help but think that the Mega Drive's colour situation is what held it back the most. The Super NES so easily beats it there. So many Super Nintendo games are just so much more colourful than anything you'd see on the Mega Drive. And the TG-16, well, that is a different situation. Some of the early games do look like they could be on the Master System, but many of the later games are really hugely colourful and really nice looking. And it's the extra stuff like layers and transparency that hold it back. With a real extra background layer, this again would have been a much tougher call. Anyway, let's leave that there. I should give a shout out to SegaRetro.org where I got loads of great info for this video. I should also thank Rodrigo Capetti whose Architecture of Consoles website is absolutely amazing and full of wonderful information. I will link to both sites below. So. Well, this is the end. Thank you, as always, to my wonderful Patreons. Your help really does make a difference. If anyone else would like to join them, there is a link below. That would be fantastic. And well, I will say thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.